So this is the lighter side of astronomy. As the name suggests, this is just supposed to be a little bit of fun, nothing too deep, just a few things that have made me laugh over the last few years. I'm going to look at the lighter side of astronomers and the lighter side of telescopes, observatories, and I don't think I've got time to cover anything else, so given that this is going to be only about half an hour or so, it'll be astronomers, telescopes and observatories. So, you think you have what it takes to be a scientist? Well, we just don't know. Yep, yeah, but that's pretty much what's going on in my head all the time. I'm a scientist, I'm also an astronomer, I'm a professional physicist, but an amateur astronomer, but still my head is full of that sort of stuff. But of course, some astronomers are scientists. They spend all of their time not just looking at the sky, but trying to make sense of it. And indeed, some astronomers are astrophysicists. And you can see from the chalkboard here, some people manage to take a wonderful hobby and turn it into a completely impenetrable science. I'm assuming you're all OK with that sort of level of maths, and I'm going to start with there and then just go up a notch if that's OK with everybody. So maybe you're familiar with the idea that there is a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of the stars. A Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is a way of cataloguing stars. We can say stars have um, a particular brightness, a particular luminosity, and we can catalogue them by saying, well, this star is red, this star is blue, this one is bright, this one is not so bright. And if we plot the stars on a colour index on the horizontal axis and on a luminosity on the vertical, then we can sort of get an idea of how stars are classified. And we see that stars aren't simply peppered over this diagram of colour in one direction and luminosity in the other. They're not peppered all over the diagram. They have particular families of giant stars and dwarf stars and so-called main sequence stars. So as astronomers, when we look at the stars, we try and catalogue them. And a little while ago, somebody had the bright idea of, well, if it's possible to catalogue the sort of families of stars that exist on a diagram, could we do the same with astronomers instead of stars? And so somebody a little while ago thought, let's try plotting people on a somewhat different diagram, a diagram that is now a horizontal axis, which is scientific output. So you can see here the scale running from right to left, just like the colour temperature does in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Here we have the astronomer's scientific output, one scientific paper, 10, 100, 1000. And on the vertical axis, the equivalent of luminosity when we're dealing with stars, this is now the luminosity of the astronomer, the luminosity of the individual. How do we measure luminosity of a person? Well, we Google their name and see how many hits we get. And of course, the more famous individuals will be higher ranked than the less obvious individuals. So I thought this was interesting. And I wondered, well, if you do this and look at scientific output, which goes to the left, and fame, which goes vertically, then I ask you to think, who do you think is the star in the top left? Who is the astronomer over the last maybe 100 years or so who has got the most scientific output and is the most famous? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or ask you to shout out your answers, but I just give you a second or two to think. Who do you think is the most famous, most scientifically prolific astronomer? Well, maybe you guessed it, maybe you didn't, but that individual there is Professor Carl Sagan. He is, according to this particular diagram, I can't vouch for the fact that it may need a little bit of updating, but at the time this particular diagram was made, Carl Sagan was the most famous, most prolific astronomer. Right next door to him is Professor Stephen Hawking. Almost the same on this particular diagram. And there are a few other individuals who you might recognise. There's Brian Cox, almost as famous, not quite as many scientific papers. And for some bizarre reason on this particular diagram, this individual over the right hand side, you can see that this individual is almost as famous, but has got no scientific papers. You can't have a zero on a logarithmic scale. Who is this? This is Mylene Class. I don't know why Mylene Class is there because she's not an astronomer, but 
she has introduced or presented some pseudoscience or scientific programs, even though she's not a scientist herself. Who else have we got here? You may recognise a few other names that the, the text is probably too small for you to read, so I'll just point out that we have Neil deGrasse Tyson, we have Chris Lintott, we have Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Various levels of fame and various levels of scientific output. I thought that was interesting to plot astronomers on the equivalent of a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It also got me thinking. Um, I'm not a professional astronomer, I'm an astronomer and I'm a scientist, so I have published scientific papers. I wonder, where would I be on that diagram? I've published about a hundred and a few scientific papers, so where would I appear on the vertical axis? So the solution, of course, is to put my name into Google. Um, you can't simply put Steve Barrett in because there are just too many Steve Barretts in the world. I had to limit it, and so I tried to reduce it to make sure I was looking at me, not some other Steve Barrett in the world. So I looked for Dr. Steve Barrett and Liverpool to make sure it was only finding me. And it got about 5,000 or so hits. So I thought, ah, right, where does that put me then? 5,000 hits on Google and 100 and something papers. That means that I appear on this diagram just there where the yellow star is. There we go. That convinces me what I've known all along. I'm on the main sequence of astronomers. In other words, I'm a totally average scientist. Well, it's good to know your place in the grand scheme of things, isn't it? There we go. So, just a bit of fun putting astronomers on a diagram where you would normally put stars. Let's have a look at a few cartoons. I like this one. A couple of cavemen looking through hollowed out logs and one is saying to the other, no, the moon still looks the same. Are you sure this is the most powerful one you have? Notice that there are various hollow logs there and apparently the big log costing $8 gives the same magnification of the moon, i.e. times one, as the smaller telescopes in the background there. I like the fact that this telescope on the right, six dollars worth, has a little finder log strapped to the side, perhaps to make it easier to find the objects you're supposed to be looking at. But what I actually like about this is not the joke itself that all of these logs have a magnification of times one. It's the fact that this individual, this particular caveman, is clearly thinking of buying a telescope. And you can tell that this individual is the, the, uh, the, the seller, the salesperson, because of the coiffured hairdo and because this individual is wearing a tie. So you can tell that that is the salesman of the, uh, the caveman era. Another little one that made me chuckle is this little cartoon showing an individual looking at the sun that's starting to be eclipsed and then the sun totally eclipsed and everything goes dark and then the sun reappears again. At which point this individual has to call in the sundial repairman. Why? Because after the sun disappeared and then reappeared again, right after the eclipse, it just keeps blinking 12 o'clock. I thought that was a wonderful way of telling you how sundials work. Put them in the shade for a while, let the sun come back, they just blink 12 o'clock until they're fixed. Great idea. And of course we're all familiar with the fact that if you put enough stone circles, stones in a circle, you end up with, what is it? Is it a calendar? Is it a clock? Well, it could be both, I suppose. But here one of the architects is talking to the other and reminding them that when summertime comes to an end, remember we have to give everything a slight turn to the left to make sure it accounts for the change in the clocks. And of course it is a complete mystery as to how these stones were actually placed in Stonehenge. Maybe they came from Wales, maybe they came from further afield. And if you ask the question, how did they move such heavy stones? Well, we just don't know. That's what Patrick might say. But of course, in this particular case, there's a clue on the left hand side as to how some of those big stones might have been moved in ancient times. Let's have a look at a few astronomers. We haven't got time to cover a lot, so I've just picked a, a few out of here. Our friend Galileo, famous astronomer and, of course, one of the first physicists who actually started to say when we're trying to work out how the world works, whether it means the Earth, the Moon, the universe in general, 
we should actually do an experiment to actually verify, not say how things should behave, but how do things actually behave. And in contrast to Aristotle, he said, let's do an experiment. Let's drop two cannonballs, a heavy one and a light one, off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And let's not assume that the heavy one hits the ground first. Let's actually do an experiment and drop a couple of cannonballs and time how long it takes for them to hit the ground. Of course, uh, Galileo didn't have uh, access to accurate timing mechanisms of any kind. He, he used his pulse to get an idea of how pendulums worked, and in this case um, he got as high as possible to get a reasonable time for the drop of the cannonballs. But it's often been asked, well, what if Galileo had had access to accurate timing machines such as computers? How would that have changed his experiments? Well, it probably wouldn't have made them more accurate, but he probably would have ended up throwing two computers off the Leaning Tower of Pisa and then seeing which one crashed to the ground first. We've all had a certain amount of frustration with technology at some point or another. And what about our friend Newton? Everybody knows the story that Newton sat down under an apple tree in an orchard outside Woolsthorpe Manor and uh, at some point, whilst reading a book perhaps, or just whilst contemplating, an apple fell on his head and at that point Newton started to think, why does the apple fall? Is it the same thing that's keeping the moon in orbit around the Earth? So you can argue that Newton discovers gravity because an apple falls on his head. That might be apocryphal, but that might have happened. What is not widely appreciated is that that same afternoon, not only did Newton discover gravity, he also discovered comedy at the same time. And for those with a particular sense of humour, this particular meme continues for one more panel, and after discovering gravity, after discovering comedy, Newton then went on to discover surrealism. And I do like the idea of a grand piano falling out of a tree just made me chuckle. And uh, Carl Sagan, of course, this individual who had the highest rating in fame and in scientific output in our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of astronomers, then you, I'm sure, are familiar with his series from the 19, was it the 70s or the 80s, Cosmos. But as a kid, people have thought this might be him. Just look at all those stars. There must be hundreds of them. And for those that don't get that particular joke, you haven't heard Sagan speak and enunciate the way he talks about billions of stars. What about telescopes? I mean, is that a fanciful telescope? Was it ever built? I don't actually know if this was ever built or whether it was just a Victorian fancy. It seems to be a very ornate way of mounting a telescope. It looks to me like it was designed such that regardless of where the telescope was pointing at the sky, the eyepiece would remain fixed at this particular point. If you notice the declination axis and the polar axis intercept at the point where the eyepiece is. What a great idea! Put the eyepiece at the point that doesn't move. So no matter where the telescope swings, you're at a comfortable viewing height. Great idea, I don't think it ever came to pass. And in more recent years, individuals have spent a great deal of effort in building their own custom-made telescopes. This one on the left is particularly interesting. It must have been very expensive, and I would guess very difficult to build. It seems to be built out of not the cheapest metal you can find. It appears to be built out of titanium which is very nice and gives a very nice polished appearance. Is that a good idea for a reflecting telescope? Possibly not a great idea, but it produces a wonderful piece of artwork as well as a functioning telescope. And of course, amateurs have been trying to build telescopes for many, many decades. Some have produced wonderful telescopes and some just really haven't got an idea what they're supposed to be doing. But when it comes to small telescopes, um, fork-mounted telescopes, maybe some of you have a fork-mounted telescope. Maybe they are quite a few centimetres in size, in diameter, in aperture. But I don't think any of you have got a telescope quite as small as this that is fork-mounted. Here we have a telescope which is fork-mounted in the true sense of the word. It's mounted on a plastic fork. <laughs> 
and the knife and the spoon make a very nice trio and then produce a tripod. So you have a tripod and a fork mounting simply by gluing three pieces of plastic cutlery together. What a great idea that is. And if you're looking for probably the best telescope in the world, then you can tell from that particular introduction that it's almost got to be a Carlsberg beer can. And yes, this is a telescope. They've taken a Carlsberg beer can, put a small mirror, much like the Newtonian reflector of the 1600s, a small mirror in the bottom, and an eyepiece with a small 45 degree mirror in it. I can't vouch for the quality, but it is not necessarily the best telescope in the world. But again, what a wonderful idea. Sometimes one is not enough when you're building a telescope and some people just want a little bit of one-upmanship and so instead of building themselves, for instance, a Dobsonian telescope, they build two side by side and perhaps you can see from the way the, uh, the optics are arranged, each eye looks into one of those two telescopes, so it's effectively a very large pair of binoculars again, must give, if they're correctly collimated, I'm not sure how easy that is to do, but if they're correctly lined up and parallel, it must give superb images of the night sky. And people have tried this idea, there's an even larger one, this time not so much a closed tube, but a skeleton or truss structure. Uh, and again, I'm not sure the size, um, I would guess that must be something of order 16 inch, something like 40 centimeters or so. Uh, this one wouldn't be that easy to use, I don't think, because the eyepiece, uh, eyepieces up here, um, you can see from the height of most of these individuals, you would need a step ladder to reach the top of this particular binocular telescope. And for some people, even two is not enough. Um, people have said, well, I want an image, but I don't want to buy a very expensive big telescope. Some have said, well, let's do it a slightly different way. There are commercially available telephoto lenses. This one happens to be a Canon 400mm telephoto lens. Why not buy a commercial lens and put a camera on the back and then when and if we can afford it, we buy a second one and a second camera and a third one and a third camera. And as funds allow, we can build up. We don't have to invest a huge amount of money in a big telescope. We can build a telescope piecemeal. And after a little while, we might have enough money for 10 of these. So 10 telephoto lenses with 10 cameras on the back. Yes, that's quite heavy, hence the need for a rather hefty paramount, in this case, equatorial mounting. But it has the advantage that you can build up the, the, the system slowly as funds allow. And it means with 10 cameras and 10 lenses, you can take 10 colors simultaneously. You can take red and green and blue, and luminosity, and hydrogen alpha, and oxygen three, and whatever else you want, because in principle you could put a different filter in front of each camera and take all of that imaging simultaneously. And if you're going to do that, why would you stop at 10? If funds allow, why would you not take it up to the limit of, let's say, 24 in this particular case? Uh, they had to change the mounting because it was getting rather heavy, and I believe this particular group, which I think is Toronto, if I remember rightly, um, they had more funds available, and so they've gone up now to 48 on two separate mountings. Size does matter, and, uh, you know, if you don't mind having a stepladder that is, what's that, three or four times higher than you are, then yes, you can build yourself a very large Dobsonian, much more cheaply than you can buy um, or, or build other um, telescopes. And so I would imagine this particular individual lives in the middle of nowhere and he chooses to do his observing from a mountain top, which I would imagine is very dark. I'm not sure I would fancy going up a stepladder like that in the dark, but well, each to his own, that's fine. And if you ask what do you think is the largest refractor ever made, the largest telescope that incorporates a glass element at the front, well, a lot of people would say, well, clearly that would be the 40-inch uh, refractor, the one-meter 40-inch refractor at Yerkes in Wisconsin. But actually, there has been a larger refractor. This was in the, uh, the Great Paris Exhibition of 1900. And here you can see one end of the refractor. It's so large that they couldn't possibly move it, so the refractor was kept fixed 
on piers and then a movable mirror at the end here, a siderostat. This mirror was moved, as you can see in this top panel, where we have a large building with the telescope running the whole, almost the whole length of the building, and the siderostat mirror was simply moved to reflect what particular object you were interested in into the telescope. In this particular case, it looks like um, the eyepiece is used to project an image of the moon onto a very large screen in front of this very large enthusiastic audience here. So I'm sure that must have been quite a spectacular sight. I would imagine they projected images of the sun and sunspots and they projected images of the moon if it was the right sort of phase. And the, uh, the, the, the mass, the size of the telescope and the size of the objective at the front there meant that it was really unfeasible, infeasible to actually move this around. You can get an idea of the size by looking at the length. I can't remember exactly what the length of this was, but this is the not the this is the the business end is at the other side where the lens is. Here we have a photographic plate holder, and you can see the photographic plates in principle were enormous if they used them that size. I'm not sure how many images ever survived from this particular telescope being used, but you can see in principle it was absolutely huge. And the eyepiece holder itself, I can't actually see a picture anywhere, I haven't found one, of the eyepieces that were used to, for instance, project the image onto the screen, but you can see from the hole in the centre of this eyepiece holder, they must have been absolutely huge. So the front element of this telescope was a little bit bigger than the Yerkes 40 inch. This one was closer to 48 inch, I think, something of that order. So more than 10% bigger than the Yerkes refractor. But unfortunately, it was used for this exhibition. But after the exhibition, it was effectively scrapped. Um, the, the objective, I think, has gone into a museum, but all of the rest of the metalwork, I think, has just been melted down, which is a little bit of a shame. Working in metal is one option, but some people prefer working in wood, and uh, if you're going to work in wood, well, why wouldn't you build a one-to-one -one full-scale model of the Hubble Space Telescope in your garage? I mean, that is a perfectly sensible thing to do. Maybe that's not a garage that looks more like a warehouse. You would need a very large volume in order to make a full-size version of the Hubble Space Telescope. But some people do build Dobsonian telescopes, for instance. It may look like a cannon, but that is a Dobsonian telescope where somebody has put a great deal of loving care into building the, uh, the wooden tube and the mountings of the Dobsonian mount. Some people prefer to buy an optical tube assembly, in other words, buy the telescope itself off the shelf, but there an individual has built himself uh, an equatorial mount out of wood to use it, rather than try and make the tube itself out of wood. And there are lots of examples where people have put a lot of love into actually making the telescope. This was made by Russell Porter, and as far as I know, it's fully functional with a mirror in this part of the telescope and a small 45 degree mirror and eyepiece here. But of course, it makes a beautiful garden ornament as well as a functioning telescope. And some people have put almost as much love into their observatories. This particular observatory is Palomar Mountain, home of the 5 metre or 200 inch Hale telescope. Um, I visited there in 1982 when I was still a student and that made a great impression on me. I thought that is a fantastic observatory, it's a fantastic telescope. And I said one day I will own a house with a garden big enough to have that in the back garden. Okay, it hasn't happened yet. That's still an aspiration. I, I brought my aspirations down somewhat a few years later and actually um, used a B&Q shed uh, with a hole in the bottom to allow the pillar to hold the, uh, the telescope in place. So not quite as impressive uh, as a back garden observatory compared to the Palomar Mountain version, but you've got to start somewhere. It housed at the time my 8-inch Mead telescope. You can see that's quite old, not from the telescope itself necessarily, but from the fact that the laptop behind it looks like a brick compared to the thin laptops that you get these days. And my observatory was made from a shed and had hinged panels that lifted up to expose the sky. 
But some people put a great deal of effort into building their observatories. I bought a B&Q shed and modified it. Other people have put their heart and soul into the housing for their telescope in their back garden. So look at that, a geodesic hemisphere there made out of triangles forming these hexagons and pentagons to give the right shape. I can't quite judge the size, maybe you can tell from the flowers or the size of the hasp or the hinges perhaps, so it's not altogether clear exactly how large that is. But of course the one downside, it's great to have an observatory in your back garden, but the one downside is maybe you don't live anywhere where you've got particularly dark skies and you'd prefer to move your telescope somewhere else. And it's a shame that you can't move the observatory with you. Having put that in your back garden, it's a shame then to take your telescope somewhere else. Can you take it with you? Well, yes, there are options. You can have, I don't know if you call that an observatory or a caravan or a car observatory or something, but what a great idea. You tow that into a dark sky area, you do your observing, and when you've had enough, you flop into bed, which is in the same construction, essentially. And you take that to whatever part of the country or whatever part of the world you're interested in observing from. Great idea. Maybe your car isn't quite up to the job of moving something quite so large, so maybe you'd like the general idea, but you would prefer something a little bit smaller. Well, that's an option as well. You can get observatories on the move that are a little bit more small car friendly. And you don't, of course, need an observatory. You can just use a telescope and take the telescope with you. And some go-to telescopes are literally that. I don't know if you need a license to drive this thing, but it's very interesting to see that we have what appears to be a telescope on a, I'm guessing it looks like it could be an equatorial mount, but it's clearly set up such that you can effectively trundle that wherever you want to go to observe. So that's not quite what we usually mean by a go-to telescope, but I thought that was a wonderful example of astronomy on the move. It's by no means the earliest example of a go-to telescope. I found these images from, I think, the 50s, um, where we have a large, perhaps 8-inch or so, refractor sitting on top of a car. I don't know if it's a publicity stunt for the car manufacturer or a publicity stunt for the telescope manufacturer, but you look at that and you think, well, that's going to be limited because surely you can't look very high above the horizon if you're limited to having it on the roof of a car. Ah, yes, but there is actually a hand crank there on the side. So, yes, if you want to, you can crank it up and look at that. You maybe can't get to the zenith, but you can certainly cover an awful lot of sky with a telescope of that size. Again, what a wonderful idea of how to put automobiles and astronomy together to make the ultimate go-to telescope. But of course nobody is actually going to do that. That was some sort of an, a publicity photograph, I guess. Nobody in their right mind would actually put a telescope on top of a car. Unless you're an American, in which case it makes perfect sense whatsoever, and as this individual has shown, I believe this individual uh, was from Florida, uh, and in this particular case he's got an equally impressive refractor, again, I would guess more than six inches aperture, maybe eight inches, nine inches aperture, on this Volvo, which is designed to take a, a little bit of excess weight. I notice that he props up the back so that the actual suspension of the Volvo doesn't give him too many problems when he's trying to point the telescope at an interesting object. Is that the ultimate in having telescopes that are mobile? Well, for an amateur it might be. The professionals got another idea. They would simply put the telescope in the back of a 747. No, that's doing astronomy with style, that is. That's the stratospheric, stratospheric observatory for infrared astronomy. Always catches me out when I try and say that. So a 747 that's been modified, you can see it's got the NASA livery there, and a, uh, an infrared telescope in the back, uh, the shutter opens, and then by a clever way of stabilising the telescope, even if the plane moves slightly, the telescope stays locked on its target. Why would you want to put it in the back of a 747? Not just to have a joyride, because you're getting above most of the atmosphere which is absorbing the infrared and that gives you much better images. It's second only to actually going into space. <laughs>
But of course we're getting beyond amateur astronomy here, so I think I'd better wrap things up. There's acknowledgements for where I've just uh, ripped off various people's cartoons or other things that made me chuckle. If you want more of the same, just go visiting here. I'll give you the links uh, in a handout later on. Thank you all for listening.